Hello, everyone, and welcome to another TPD seminar. Uh, today we have two really fantastic speakers for you. Um, I'm going to introduce the first one in the beginning, and then we will switch over halfway through to our second speaker. So our first speaker today is Wu Bing Zhang. Uh, Wu Bing is a PhD student in Shirley Liu's lab here at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. His research focuses on identifying novel therapeutic targets in cancer by machine learning modeling and integrative mining of high throughput data. So I'm going to hand over to Wubing to get started on his talk. Yeah, thank you, Catherine, for the invitation and the kind of introduction. And also thank the entire committee for organizing this wonderful webinar service. Um, I started to work on protein degradation in 2019. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, I started to work on protein degradation in 2019, and uh, I have learned a lot from this webinar series. And today, it's my great pleasure to present my recent work of using machine learning to predict the tractable targets of protein degraders. As most of you are familiar with, the ubiquitin proteasome system is the most prevalent pathway for selective protein degradation in, in, in eukaryotic cells. Basically in this process, the substrate protein will be ubiquitinated by the E3 ubiquitin ligase with the help of the E2 ubiquitin conjugating enzyme. After repeated rounds, the substrate protein will be polyubiquitinated and the polyubiquitin chain often directs the protein for degradation by the proteasome. And as we all know, the targeted protein degradation is a novel pharmacological modality that utilizes a small molecule to recruit a protein of interest and an E3 ubiquitin ligase into proximity, which allows for the um, ubiquitination and subsequent protein degradation of the protein target. This molecule could be a protag, a heterobifunctional small molecule that consists of a ligand of an E3 ubiquitin ligase and another ligand of a protein of interest connected by a linker. It could also be a molecular glue, uh, which is a small molecule, molecule that could induce novel interaction between an E3 and a protein of interest. Um, the TPD field has grown exponentially in recent years, as you can see from the publications. And this year, an AR degrader and an ER degrader have entered the clinic test and uh, the initial data look positive. And 11 more de protein degraders will also be tested soon. And an outstanding question in this field is, what will be the future success of this field uh, of the targeted protein degradation approaches? The answer might not only rely on the right drug for development, but also the right target for right patients. So in our studies, we focused on the um, identifying rational cancer targets for developing protein degraders. And basically we reasoned the promising targets should be disease causing proteins with stability dependencies and these promising targets should also be degradable by the targeted protein degradation approaches. To study the, so in cancer, the disease causing proteins should be the cancer driver genes. And then to study the stability dependency of the cancer driver genes, we, uh, our previous study investigated the impact of cancer driver variants on protein degradation. And we found about 19% of driver gene mutations impact protein degradation. And we also found about 30% of the genetic fusions will lead to diagonal loss in the oncogene proteins, which further increase the stability of oncogene proteins. These dysregulation events could inform uh, the candidate targets for uh, future drug development. And uh, the second part of this, uh, uh, and the second question is whether those targets are degradable by the targeted protein degradation approaches. That is also my focus uh, in this talk. 
substantial work have been done to survey the protein degradability uh, using a chemical proteomic approach. And uh, basically, uh, researchers from Dr. Nathaniel Gray and uh, Eric Fisher lab um, designed multi kinase degraders that could engage multiple kinase targets. And then by profiling the proteome wide response to multi kinase degrader treatment, we can assess the frequency of degradation of these kinase targets. Based on Catherine's uh, uh, data, uh, we can see many kinase targets are frequently degraded by these degraders. And uh, we also see a group of kinases, although they were um, engaged by um, at least one degrader, but they were never degraded in this study and suggesting the difference of the degradability. This chemoproteomic approach have significantly expanded the degradable prote proteome, um, but this approach is inapplicable for most of the human proteins because of the lack of compounds for the screening. So in our study, we asked, can we use computational method to predict the protein degradability? And uh, as we all know that the ternary complex formation is required for the uh, targeted protein degradation. So in previous study, Catherine compared the ternary complex formation with the protein degradation. And here we can see a high proportion of the kinase targets were um, degraded uh, by the multi-kinase degraders, but they don't show um, the detectable ternary complex formation. We also see a group of kinase targets that were complex with the degraders, but uh, not degraded. This suggests that the ternary complex formation is not sufficient for degraded induced protein degradation. And we really that maybe the protein intrinsic features uh, might be associated with the targeted protein degradation. And to test this hypothesis, basically we collected a, a group of uh, features intrinsic to protein targets. And we asked, can we use these features to predict the protein degradability? And basically we collected uh, features um, um, spanning the protein expansion, protein length, post translational modification, protein-protein interaction, and protein stability. And the, 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 all of these features uh, were built based on publicly available data sets and the expansion features include the uh, mRNA level expansion and protein abundance. And the protein length indicate, might indicate the protein size. And the protein-protein interaction is quite complicated in the cell. So to make it simple here, we just estimate the number of interacted proteins for each protein, which might reflect the potential of a protein being complex in the cell. And for features associated with post-translational modifications, uh, we estimated uh, the, uh, the fraction of sites with reported PTM sites, uh, PTM events in the phosphocyte plus database. Basically, the PTM sites include, include the phosphorylation sites, acetylation sites, and ubiquitination sites. Uh, all of the data are downloaded from the phosphocyte plus database. And for ubiquitination, we have a feature termed ubiquitination potential, which is estimated as the fraction of lysine sites with reported evacuation events. So similarly, we also have features like the phosphorylation um, uh, potential, acetylation potential, and uh, also uh, uh, um, other uh, PTM events associated with features. So we also have features associated with the protein stability and the protein stability features are uh, built based on the protein half-life data and the, the protein stability data. This diagram shows the mass spec based technology for uh, determining the protein half-lives. And the, here we see the dynamic cell-like labeling is used and the, the heavy isotope labeled the, labels the amino acids from the protein synthesis and uh, the light amino acids, um, uh, the decrease of the light, amino acid, light isotope labeled amino acids indicates the protein degradation. 
by uh, modeling the time course change of the uh, light isotope and heavy isotope, we can finally estimate the protein half-life. The protein stability is determined based on this GPS vector, which is a lattice viral construct encoding two fluorescent proteins. And this technology is um, actually uh, developed by the Dr. Um, Steve Allage lab. And uh, basically the two fluorescent proteins, the DSRAD and GFP are expressed from the same, uh, from the same transcripts. So the GFP versus uh, GFP DSRAD ratio could serve as the readout of the protein stability and which uh, reflects the stability of the GFP fusing peptide. We collected all of the publicly available uh, protein half-life data and the, the GPS profiling data and the constructs of the features. And then we asked, can we classify the highly degradable and the lowly degradable kinases um, based on these features and using machine learning methods? The highly degradable kinases were collected uh, from Catherine's study and the, uh, these kinases were degraded by at least five different multi-kinase degraders. And the lowly degradable kinases were those that were engaged by at least one degrader, but were never degraded by the multi-kinase degraders. So we tried six commonly used machine learning model, including random forest, the uh, SVM, naive Bayan, logistic regression, and the as the neighbor. And here, as you can see, the random forest model achieves the highest performance with an array under the uh, under the precinct recall curve of 0.76. And this model is selected as the final model to do the further investigation. And we termed this model as the MAPD, which is short for model-based analysis of protein degradability. So we investigated investigated what, which features is important in um, this model for predicting protein degradability. And we found that the ubiquitination potential is the most informative feature for predicting kinase degradability. As I mentioned before, the ubiquitination potential is determined as the fraction of lysine residues with the reported ubiquitination events. And here we can see the highly degradable kinases have significantly higher ubiquitination potential than the lowly degradable kinases. In contrast, the fraction of lysine sites shows no significant difference in the two group of proteins, suggesting the importance of the ubiquitination for targeted protein degradation. So to evaluate the performance of our model, we collected the um, protein degradation data of the multi kinase degraders and also the paired target engagement data. And we tested the predicted degradability of degraded kinases and other engaged and not degraded proteins. Here, we can see that the, engaged, the degraded proteins have consistently higher predicted degradability than other engaged and not degraded proteins. And although for the later three degraders, the p-value is not significant because of the, the limited number of kinases involved in the analysis. We further evaluate, evaluate our model by collecting the uh, degradable kinases that were degraded by at least one multi-kinase degraders. And we tested whether our predicted degradability is correlated with the frequency of degradation of these kinases. Here, we observed significant positive correlation. Together, this data suggests our model has good performance in predicting degradable kinase targets. So because the mechanism of the protein degradation is consistent for both the kinase and non-kinase proteins, so we asked, can, uh, uh, is the model able to predict the degradability of non-kinase proteins? To test this, um, to answer this question, we first collected a group of uh, um, proteins that were um, frequently degraded by imid drugs or the imid-based protex. And here we can see the predicted scores uh, uh, are 
significantly correlated with the frequency of degradation of the emitter targets. Furthermore, we collected a group of transcription factors that have been targeted by the targeted protein degradation approaches. And uh, here we labeled um, all of the, uh, the TF targets and we, see, we can see that most of the TF targets have high MAPD prediction scores, except the BCL6 that might have biased the prediction. Furthermore, we collected the other non-kinase targets from the, that have been targeted by the uh, protax um, that uh, the molecules are recorded in protag db or protag pedia. And here we can see the protag targets have significantly higher prediction scores than other drug targets from the drug bank. Together, this data suggests maybe our model is also generalizable to protein targets outside of the kinome. Given the good performance of our model in predicting degradability of both kinase and non-kinase, we extend our predictions to alcogene proteins downloaded from the AlcoKB database. And we identified more than 200 alcogene proteins um, as degradable proteins. And among the top degradable alcogene proteins, we can see the PLK1, MDM2, CDK6, that, that already have publicly available protag molecules. And we also see some novel targets such as the ATF1, RHOA, and the ABO2 that have publicly available small molecule ligands recorded in the CHEMBL database. And these ligands could serve as start points for future development of the protein degraders. So given the importance of evacuation potential in predicting protein degradability, we asked how the structural property of the evacuation sites influence the protein degradability. To test this, um, we, I collaborated with Shoya, a postdoc in Dr. Eric Fisher lab. Shoya did computational docking of kinase targets onto cerebral DDB1 Call for your book, uh, the E3 ubiquitin ligase complex. And here we show CDK1 as one example. And we use the RBX1 fragment to estimate the position of the E2 enzyme. So, because in the ubiquitination process, um, the, the uh, ubiquitin could be transferred from an E2 to a broader, uh, to, to a lysine site on the on the substrate protein or the target protein. And the, 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 because of the flexibility of the cow 4 arm, the ubiquitin could be transferred to a broad zone, to a lysine residue in a broad zone of the target protein. To, to assess the accessibility of lysine sites to the E2 enzyme, we draw two plates based on the position of the cerebellum and the target protein. Here we can see the two plants separate all of the lysine sites into four quadrants. And we consider the quadrant facing, e, facing to the E2 as the ubiquitination zone. And next, based on this uh, docking model for each kinase, we selected top 200 models. And in each model, we determined whether a lysine site is inside or outside of the UB zone. And because we have 200 models for each kinase, and finally we determined the E2 accessibility of each lysine site by calculating the fraction of models in which the lysine site is in the UB zone. So based on the E2 accessibility data, we further tested whether the E2 accessible lysine site is uh, associated with protein degradability. Here we can see without the consideration of E2 accessibility, the total number of lysine sites shows no significant difference in the highly degradable and the lowly degradable kinases. With the consideration of E2 accessibility, uh, still no significant difference. We see the number of E2 accessible lysine sites uh, shows no significant difference in the, two group, in the two group of proteins. But when we focus on the ubiquitination sites, we see the highly degradable kinases have more UB sites than the lowly degradable kinases. 
And uh, the E2 accessible UP sites also shows significant difference in the two group of proteins. And when we looked at the p-values, we observed the, uh, the decreased p-value, which indicates more significant correlation between the number of UB sites and uh, the protein degradability when we considered the E2 accessibility. So which indicates the informative role of the E2 accessibility in predicting protein degradability. So to test, to further examine whether this, uh, the, whether the E2 accessible UV sites are in particular associated with protein degradability, we shuffled all of the ubiquitination sites among all of the licensed sites in each protein, and then reevaluate the correlation between E2 accessible UV site and protein degradability using the Wilcox and Z statistic. By doing the shuffling for one, uh, 10,000 times, we generate a non-distribution, which reflects the um, a random association between the E2 accessible UB sites and the protein degradability. Here we can see the observed correlation is significantly higher than the random distribution, suggesting that the E2 accessible UB sites are particularly associated with protein degradability. So finally, we Im implemented a web platform which incorporates on the protein intrinsic features, the predicted protein degradability and uh, the E2 accessibility of the ubiquitination sites and also other uh, publicly available uh, and useful information such as the ligandability and disease association of the proteins. This platform could um, enable rational selection of degradable targets for developing degraders. And uh, you can access this platform uh, using this website. And we also implemented an R package on um, which uh, could enable users to reproduce our model um, and which could also enable future extension of the um, degradability prediction uh, when more degradability data or more future data are available in the future. So in summary, in this study, I developed, developed a machine learning model to predict the tractability of targeted protein degradation. And we found the ubiquitination potential is the most important feature for predicting protein degradability. And uh, by benchmarking, we found our model is not only uh, able to predict the degradability of kinases, but also is generalizable to the proteins outside of the kinome. So we extended our predictions to alcogene proteins and found more than 200 um, the degradable alcogene proteins. And given the importance of ubiquitination potential in predicting protein degradability, we further investigated the structural property of ubiquitination sites and found the E2 accessible ubiquitination sites and not the licensed sites in general are associated with protein degradability. Our paper is um, uh, on BioCAF now. If you are interested, you can download it. And finally, I would like to acknowledge Dr. Shirley Liu, my supervisor for continuous support. Also thank Colin Token for um, the, uh, the guidance and all of the suggestions in this study. And also thank Jia for uh, developing the uh, web platform. Thank Shen Qing, Ze Xian, Bo Ning, Yang, and all of the other lab members uh, for help in this study. I would like also to thank my collaborators, including Shoya Catherine from Dr. Eric Fritsch Lab. Uh, Shoya did uh, all of the computational uh, docking work, and Catherine gave a lot of suggestions and provided uh, all of the data for an analysis. And uh, also thank Chris Sander for um, the valuable suggestions. Also thank all of the funding supports. And finally, uh, thank all of you for attention and I'm happy to take questions. So our second speaker today is Marcus Kreiser. Um, he got interested in protein degradation during his master's in biochemistry at Free University Berlin, where he worked on understanding proteasome function. 
Uh, he further gained broad knowledge in respiratory diseases, information and oncology while pursuing a PhD in biomedical sciences at an international graduate program at UGLC in Germany and Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Uh, Marcus then moved on to a postdoctoral training at Northwestern, uh, where he characterized the regulation of ubiquitin ligase, HOYL, um, as a key mechanism of tumor adaptation to hypoxia. Then prior to joining GSK, he specialized in ubiquitin ligase recruitment at the um, Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research. Currently, Marcus is a GSK fellow and scientific director in the protein degradation group at GSK, and he leads the technology team and multiple collaborations with biotechs and academia. So we're very happy to have you here today, Marcus. Uh, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much, Catherine, and thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation. And I can really echo what Wu Bing was saying, that this is really a wonderful uh, webinar, se uh, seminar series that you guys really created for the whole TBD field. And it's really, for me, a must attend event in my diary. And just a few weeks ago, we had a very nice workshop around dagrons and tags, which we used in the uh, targeted protein degradation field. So I will not go in too much into the details just that these tags are really coming in different flavors. They have advantages and disadvantages. What I would like to highlight is really one tag in particular, which is the HALO tag, which we are using uh, very often because of its very uh, satellite um, properties, which, we, which are very important for us. For example, we can introduce a mutant into the tag so it's not able to bind the ligand. We can use enantiomer, which are equally not binding, and the tag itself can be easily detected by antibody and fluorescent dyes. So what I would like to highlight now are a few applications, how we're using these tags to characterize novel E3 ligases, to screen and identify novel E3 ligase binders. And this goes really back uh, to a collaboration with Craig Cruz at the time where we, we call it Halo Protex, which was basically, we used the VHL uh, ligase binder and we conjugated it to a chloride cane. So it can interact with the Halo tag and brings uh, the ligase in proximity to your target and you can study its degradation. In case of GFP, obviously it's a very nice readout because you can measure it um, on the fluorescence disappearance. But what we haven't noticed at the time is really how useful this tag is uh, to study the protein degradation of a target, in particular, the dose response, which is quite important for us, a time course, which is then also affecting the maximal degradation. And usually we can achieve very high degradation as a maximum, which is a challenging thing as we heard from the uh, folks from the Broad Institute. On the other hand, uh, we can also introduce a mutant to the halo tag. So the mutant halo is unable to degrade and that represents a very nice control and potential counter screen. And also, depending on the linker, we can really see that we can mimic the typical protec um, um, phenotype with a potential hook effect. So how are we using this for novel E3 ligase binder? And this is really, we are over-expressing uh, ligase in the fusion protein with the halo tag, which we then can use to chloroalkane ligand for any kind of target and to study its degradation. So now, not only the Fisher lab, uh, we are also very fond of promiscuous kinase degrader experiments because it gives us really the opportunity to profile the ligase activity against the whole kinome and we can uh, benchmark it uh, to VHL and Celebron, which are obviously very active and very promiscuous. So for example, last year, the Fisher and the Abbott lab, uh, they were publishing uh, small molecule induced BCL6 uh, degradation and polymerization and describing that CR1 as the ligase which was involved in this process. So we were really wondering whether CR1 could be an 
in uh, ligase suitable for targeted protein degradation in Protex. So what we did, we overexpressed the CR1 ligase with the halo tag. We used the promiscuous kinase uh, chloroicane ligand. And then we measured the degradation of highly degradable kinases. In this case, we started with FAK because it was highly degradable, which we have also seen from the Fisher lab as well. We have also some interest in FAK as we have published previously. The interesting thing, however, was that CIA was very efficient in degrading FAK and was almost similar uh, compared to the Celebron promiscuous kinase de degrader. And now we are profiling the whole kinome and proteomics analysis to see how this is benchmarking uh, to our workhorse ligases. So one logical consequence of this kind of experiments is to test also ligase binders, which are uh, identified. And one of these early um, opportunities came across when the story around Edusalem was published, where it was described as a molecular glue for RBM39 by interacting to DK15. And it was really a gold rush at the time because the whole TBD field was wondering whether Indisulam could be equally used, uh, similar to the lidomide and other emits which could be incorporated into Protex and used for targeted protein degradation. So what we used and we identified an exit vector from the publication where we were conjugating the chloride came to it. So we made in the Sulam halo Protex, which then of course we could easily test on our halo GFP cell line. So you can see there's some very mild moderate effect uh, on GFP abundance, um, mainly with, with a high concentration. So you would say that was probably a very weak degradation, if at all. When we counter screen in the halo mutant cell line, you can see there was obviously no difference uh, at all, which is indicating probably more some cytotoxic effects. And we further characterized in the Sulam in a, we call it multiplex protein dynamics experiment, which we have just touched on it in the previous experiment, where we combined silic labeling together with uh, mass spec, which really allows us to discriminate between two population, mature protein population and newly synthesized nascent proteins, which we can study and chase over a period of time. And this really gives us the opportunity to identify genuine protein degradation as well as also transcriptional regulation. In case of Indi Sulam, when we did this, we could reproduce the finding from the literature. And you can see RBM39 was degraded in the mature as well as in the nascent population. And this seems to be very selective and comparing it to lalidomide, which it's known uh, multiple new substrate, it seems that this process was quite selective, at least um, in our cells. The other thing what we noticed was really a high concentration and in a prolonged time uh, course, we could see that the whole proteome is shifting, which is a clear indication for cytotoxicity. And this might explain the results we have seen with the halo Protex. And that's probably maybe not surprising uh, for a CDK inhibitor, what in the Sulam was originally uh, developed. But one additional advantage of this high leg labeling is, and Wuban uh, touched on this, is really we can measure degradation, half life, as well as resynthesis rate. Uh, depending on the time and the condition of the assay. And when we did this with RBM39 and the treatment with Indusulam, we see obviously a very fast uh, degradation of RBM39. But then we discovered something which probably, at least to my knowledge, is not really described in the TBD field up to now, and this is really after the degradation of RBM39, we identified that the resynthesis rate of RBM39 is increasing tenfold, which is indicating that there might be some feedback mechanism. 
And we can also see this in downstream proteins, such as PRP39, which is associated with RBM39, but to a much lower level. So this kind of finding, I think, is quite interesting. And we, I think it remains to be seen whether this is a more general mechanism which we encounter in the targeted protein degradation field when we are targeting with protex and other degraders, particular essential proteins in the cell. So after we dropped uh, indusulam for protex and probably uh, most people in the TBD field, I think in a very elegant study, the Fisher Lab and others uh, published and identified the mechanism of action, describing that RBM39 function as an interaction stabilizer between DCAP15 and indisulam and increasing its binding affinity. So what we learned from this, it was really that there are probably more molecular glues out there than anticipated. And that's not a trivial thing because you have to keep in mind that pharma is spending a lot of resources to maintain their comp car, uh, compound collection to curate, uh, maintain, and to ex extend. So one question which really kept me up at night was how many potential ligase binders do we have already in our compound uh, collection? And to identify this, uh, we were setting up a phenotypic screen, and you can guess uh, with our halo protex. So we ident or we we took compounds from the GSK compound collection, uh, three thousand primary and secondary amines, which we used as a proof of concept, uh, and we used this diverse set, and we were conjugating it to the chloride canes, and we then we screened it in the halo protec uh, in the halo tech GFP and counter screened it in the mutant uh, halo tech GFP cell line. So you can imagine that any reduction or significant reduction of GFP would potentially represent an um, interesting ligand which could be then incorporated in, into protex. And this is really the beauty of phenotypic screening because we're not screening against one particular ligase, but the whole ligase which are expressed and which are active in the cell line. So you could easily imagine to adapt this uh, to a setting where you screen for cell type specific ligases, which is of course of high interest uh, for us at GSK. On the other hand, and I know that we are particularly interested into ligases and protex, but we see the rapidly expanding field of other alternative degradation modalities, and there's no reason to believe why you cannot identify other potential degradation binders with this kind of screen. So the principle was quite straightforward, but what was more challenging was really the chemistry. And to make it a really feasible approach, we decided to do it in a high throughput uh, way. So we did all the 3000 reaction on 384 well plate in 20 microliters, and we didn't do any purification afterwards. So what that leads that obviously this reaction is affected also by steric hindrance, but what was important for us, that the majority of these compounds that we had a good conversion, and we can see that at least two thirds uh, achieved this goal. So when we went to the um, screen, uh, we tested different time points uh, as well as concentration, and we screened all our halo products, which we generated uh, to, to that point. And you can see the replication is actually quite neat. It's very tight and you can easily spot the VHL uh, positive controls down here. And then we moved into the full uh, uh, data with the full compound set, 3000 compounds, um, single shot in wide type uh, halo tag GFP and counter screened in the mutant uh, halo tag. And you can see besides the VHL positive control, the hits which are popping up here, there were a few hits which we are moving into this di direction, indicating that this could be potentially of 
interest and we selected nine specific hits uh, for this metaphor uh, to follow up with full dose response curves. So from these nine, six we were able to validate and we see nice dose response curves. Uh, we further characterize this, we did this in uh, two additional screens where we have uh, at least 50% degradation as well, uh, higher than 40% respectively, as well as in the mutant halotech less than 50 and less than 30 respectively. Now, despite the fact that phenotypic screening, the setup seems to be quite easy and it's becoming more and more popular. The real challenge of these phenotypic screens is the deconvolution of the hits and we were then mainly focusing on, on two of the, the top hits, which we took forward to resynthesize and to further investigate. So the top hit after the resynthesis, unfortunately, we didn't see any differential degradation between the mutant and the halo tag. And this can happen uh, probably due to alternative uh, chemical compound formation or the crude mixture. So that was quite disappointing, but a typical false positive. The second hit um, after resynthesis, we were still able to see the differentiated uh, degradation, which was quite encouraging. But then later on, we really noticed that this was a very toxic compounds uh, inducing strong, affecting the cell viability very strongly. And interestingly, despite the fact that these two cell lines were generated from the same parental cell line, it seems that there's some clonal difference between uh, the mutant halo tag and the white type halo tag, which makes it then the white type uh, more sensitive to the compound, which then explains um, the results in the first place. So, but at the time, um, this was really an, a study coming out from the Kravat group showing in a similar mechanism that they're screening electrophilic uh, library. Instead of the halo tag, they, they used FKBB12 and then they had instead of fluorescence a luciferase readout. And in fact, it luckily it was more, um, more productive and uh, identified the potential, or well, they, they identified a novel uh, ligase binder for DCAF11. So I think it really shows how robust the system is and with the right screening and the cell line and the library, uh, you can really achieve um, some nice results. But what was probably more intriguing for us um, at the time is that we realized that we can generate hundreds of halo proteins and we can screen them within days. And we were trying to capitulate on this high throughput chemistry and we were thinking how we can apply these high throughput chemistry from the halo proteins into our normal process um, for the protex synthesis. And this is a pro process we now call direct to biology or D2B. So the principle is the same like the halo cortex, but in this case, we have already a very extensive library, which is basically the ligase binder with the linker. And, you, and, we, and we can conjugate this to the warhead of your protein of interest to generate the full protein. So this you can really miniaturize in 1536 valve plates, which can be easily plated by a liquid handling robot which is here and you can incubate this overnight and then you have your whole set of proteins. So this uh, direct to biology approach is only uh, taking place over three days from the starting reaction plating out the library uh, to the reaction overnight then you can follow up uh, the quality control with LCMS and at the same time you're plating out uh, the the reactions um, in dilution curves, you're adding your cells, you incubate overnight again, standard degradation assay, and you have your readout on, on the third day. So that's actually a very nice workflow. And we were looking where we can apply this um, to some kind of 
project to validate and to do a proof of concept study. And the opportunity came along with uh, when GSK discovered its new novel BID4 ligase binder, which wasn't really described and utilized for products. So we said that would be probably a good idea to utilize this. And we used three vectors from the series and we conjugated it with our ligase linker library. So in total, we generated over 180 um, protects. And then we profiled uh, these protects in the BID4 hybrid format. And what you can see is uh, you have a lot of compounds which are not active. Um, then you have some compounds which show moderate activity. But interestingly enough, there is, with all three vectors, we got very potent hits right from the start in these crude ex extract. And when we identified these hits, they actually showed also some potential SAR. So we took these forward, um, these potent uh, compounds and to try to compare how the crude uh, protec is comparing to the purified protec. And the surprising thing was that we have a remarkable agreement between the crude compounds and the purified protex which are resulting um, very similar um, across a, a range of potency. And we were able to identify uh, picomolar um, active BRD4 degraders, novel BRD4 degraders with this kind of workflow. So in summary, um, you can see that this D2B is really a fantastic way because to identify the, the appropriate ligase. The ligase uh, is the linker length, um, the vector and potential SAR. And this within three days, which is of course an, an ideal starting point for any kind of protec project. So I don't have the time today um, to go more into the detail, but in fact, you can imagine that you can take any kind of protect described from the literature and profile it through this D2B and to see how well optimized this protect is. Are there other alternative starting points which might be ev even more potent? So I hope I gave you an idea um, what kind of different high throughput workflows we are using to identify novel degraders. And with this, I would like to thank the whole GSK team and our collaborators, and of course you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any question.